individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. everybody and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. I've got kind of a fun and interesting show tonight because it's all about wishing stones. And when it comes to crystals and stones, there's nobody better to talk to but Nicholas Pearson. And I think he and I went digging around for some history, some lore, whatever else we could find out about wishing stones. And I think we probably came up with a little bit of stuff. So, and we do have a lot of time lot to talk about. So, Nicholas, jump in. Hi. (laughs) Hello. Thanks for having me back on. Well, listen, I can't do anything about rock stones (laughs) or crystals without you. I mean, you're my crutch (laughs) and and the person I learned from, and that's important. Well, it's my pleasure to be as supportive as any crutch. How's that? I like that. Mm -hmm. Now, we just hope somebody doesn't come walking by and kick out from under me or something, (laughs) but... You know, it's like Charlie Brown and the football, but I think everything's good. (laughs) So, okay, so to be honest, I'm going to start out with a confession. Because until just very, very, very recently, um, I didn't even know what a wishing stone was. And, um, you know, seeing as how we have this, like, literal quarry in the backyard, I I picked one up one day and I thought, oh, it's got this white circle around it. And it's really kind of cool. And I looked it up, and there it was, witching, I mean, witching, wishing stones. So then I began digging around, and um, they came in all shapes and sizes and, you know, different colors and everything. But um, after I got a collection, I began to wonder what the heck I'm supposed to do with them. And that's about the time I ran to you to see if you knew anything about them. So how familiar were you um, with the wishing stone before I knocked on your door? You know, truth be told, apart from maybe um, scrolling through social media and seeing seeing uh, some memes with them, I, I'd only kind of anecdotally seen people talk about wishing stones. And so I I, I wanted to learn more. I'm, I'm definitely curious to see where exactly this originates. I, I never came to a firm conclusion, but I think as we'll talk about in a little while, there's there's a, a bigger principle at play, a really long-standing principle that that you know will will follow the thread backwards through time and, and see where it it might have some really early ancestry. Yeah, all I've heard, all I saw was centuries old. But, you know, I, I don't know if they carved it in stone and let people know or, or you know, it was mouth to mouth coming down the, the years. But it, it's fascinating. So, okay, I'm just going to run over the simple stuff that I found and feel free to jump in. And then I'm sure you found some things that weren't quite as simple as my brain. But um, for people that don't know, again, a wishing stone is, and they call it a, a wishing rock as well. It's it's a rock um, with a white line that goes completely around the circumference of it. And legend says that if you find one, if you're if you find one at the seashore, you make a wish and then throw the stone into the ocean. Um, other people say if you trace your finger around the line while closing your eyes and making a wish and then throw the stone uh, far away from you, um, that'll work. But Here's the thing. If you make a wish for yourself, it'll happen. But if you make a wish on behalf of somebody else, then all of your wishes will come true. And then some people say um, if you make a wish and then give it to someone else, hand it over to them, 
um, you'll have your wish come true. So there are a lot of different schools of thought um, as far as that goes. And I think they can pretty much be found in it everywhere because I was surprised um, about the fact that they were at the seashore and then, you know, here they're in, in the middle of a city or something like River Rock or something like that. Um, did you find out what uh, the composition of a wishing stone is and especially like that band around it? Yeah, so let's let's do the geology part first. Um, okay. There's there's no firm composition for what what makes a a wishing stone a wishing stone because it's it's largely an aesthetic definition. So, okay. um, I, from all the specimens I've been able to lay eyes upon, a lot of them appear to be, generally speaking, sedimentary rock in in some formation. The white bands tend to be either silica based, some form of quartz, or sometimes they're calcareous. They've got stuff like limestone or calcite or other calcium based stuff in there that forms that particular band. Um, mm-hmm. I've I've seen some evidence that some of them have what we call foliation. Um, and it just so happens that they've got that nice little white folia, that white layer smack dab in the middle or pretty darn close to it. And that's usually a sign of metamorphic activity. Um, so essentially what, what makes a wishing stone a wishing stone is our sort of cultural association with it rather than some sort of geological association. And if we think about where they come from, and because it's it's such a wide and diverse thing, by the time we end up with a, you know, a handheld size piece of stone, we're, we're only seeing part of the geological history of it. So those, mm-hmm. that singular white band might have been one of many in a large piece of rock that was weathered and eroded and carried across the eons of time to bring it to us. So there's, there's a lot of sort of geological storytelling that's happening with these stones, and it's going to vary from piece to piece. And the, the thing is that it's, it's just so striking to see that white band. There's something really you know, kind of jarring almost to find something that looks as if it's wearing a belt or it's had its equator painted. And yeah. we, we, we relate to the specialness, the otherness of that. It stands out. And this whole concept of stones that stand out has been, you know, really the, the forerunner of everything rock related that we see in the world today from crystal healing to, you know, wearing precious gemstones to, you know, talismanic magic that, that uses specific gems. It, it all starts from this impulse to pay attention to rocks that look and feel special. Mm-hmm. It's amazing because, I mean, they draw you in um, immediately because they, I mean, sometimes they look like an Oreo cookie, you know, and, and then I did read, and I don't know how much sense this makes, but um, one of the articles that I came to said the stones are formed when pieces of older rocks and other loose material get pressed and cemented together um, and that the lines form when heat and pressure change to, uh, pressure changes the structure of an existing rock so I mean I, I guess there's a lot of theories on 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 that but bottom line is there's plenty of them to go around huh <laughs> Absolutely. And in today's world, who couldn't use an extra wish or two, right? Yeah, yeah. And and like I told you a little while ago, um, I've got so many now that that I don't know why I needed to keep collecting them. Every time I saw one out there and I would go digging, I, I you know, was arm wrestling with lizards to get off the rock so I could grab the one I wanted. Um, and then I'm thinking geez, I've got all these rocks and I'm hoarding them. You know, I mean, I, I shouldn't be. I should be using them or giving them away or something like that because that's really the truth of it. But then we're going to talk a little bit later about maybe the theory behind it and, and nothing is carved in stone as far as they go. We can make our own rules, right? Absolutely. You know, so so far as I could tell, this this particular concept of a wishing stone with this particular pattern, shape kind of concept um, – has has no super well defined or documented history. Um, it seems there's there's oral versions of the stories that are kind of passed da- down in in different regions, and they don't all necessarily match up. So I I'm almost wondering if this isn't a case of what we might call parallel or even convergent evolution, mm-hmm. um, where it's not a singular phenomenon that has you know stemmed from a single place, a single point of origin, and then branched out what we call divergent evolution. Um, And so it's really pointing toward this idea that we have this 
this impulse. We, we want to pick up rocks. I mean, I know I do, and I always mm-hmm. have. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I know that's not unique to me. Um, no. So um, I, I did some digging to see where and how this idea of finding stones, returning stones back to nature, and, and why we pay attention to special stones really kind of came into being. And I think that context provides us some some clues for how and why we might take inspiration from wishing stones mm-hmm. or any other stones in our lives for that matter. Yeah, there's something very compelling because I didn't start out looking for them, obviously, but I, you know, I'd be out in the backyard and I've got, you know, a little garden going and <clears throat> I see these little stones and I think, I think as I sent you, I said, oh, look, I think this is quartz, you know, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And some are speckled, you know, little Dalmatian stones. And it was, it was those that draw, drew me in. And right now, um, here where I'm sitting, I have like jars of pretty stones all over the place that I've been picking up from the yard. And there's like a million more there. And and I stopped for a minute. I thought, you've never picked up stones before. You know, what what came over you all of a sudden that all of a sudden I'm, I'm noticing them? You know, I've been here for several years. And okay, there were a lot of rocks and stones out there. But something all of a sudden kicked in with me. And now I just keep picking up the little ones that I like and you know again just on display not doing anything with them yeah totally I I I obviously relate to that on so many levels um it's one of those things um I don't know if you've ever read um I think it was E squared by by Pam Grout and she's got all these fun like takes on the sort of universal laws everything from Mm -hmm. the law of attraction to all all the sort of hermetic principles that you find out there but she's got one that she calls the vw jetta principle principle Mm -hmm. and you know it's the whole idea you when you're going out to shop for a car and you're trying to decide on the one you do lots of homework you do everything you can or maybe you do it on impulse but you, you do it because of how it makes you feel and then once you get behind the wheel of the car you see that car everywhere you, you recognize that there are so many of them out there in the world. And the idea behind this isn't that because you got the car, you've created more in the universe. But when you tune in, when you set the wavelength, when you dial into that particular station, you perceive it and you perceive how wide those ripples go. And so, so much of what we do magically, spiritually, metaphysically, really has to deal with fine-tuning our radio, our, our perception, our, our skills in that regards. And so when we, when we tune into that first wishing stone, or, or for me, last summer it was flint, all mm. of a sudden I found flint everywhere I went, um, mm. in, in unexpected places, in very expected places. I mean, I'm, I'm stopped in a parking lot in Glastonbury, and everybody else is looking at, you know, historic scenery in the tour. And I'm looking down at my feet going, <laughs> oh, my gosh, there's Flint here, too. So, um, yeah, I, I totally get why and how that can be so compelling. All, all we really mm-hmm. have to do is kind of tune in. And then suddenly the universe rewards us for, mm-hmm. for you know, choosing that focus. Yeah, it, it's rather amazing because it seems like now I'm the ones that really catch my eye really are catching my eye. And I... I kind of have to pick it up and take it either to my flower bed or in the house because I'm afraid I would lose it you know and that to me is just so not me you know I'm, I'm just like whoa no I can't let this one go I get very um maternal about it and, and it sounds mm-hmm. silly maybe but yeah it, it's really really interesting what that happens and I'm curious um the chat room is pretty full and we'll be talking about stuff in a second but I'm wondering if anybody in the chat room um have wishing stones or knew about them and and if so tell me so okay we've got a 30 second delay on that but yeah but you were also talking about um you know the 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 anecdotal evidence you know um and and this is kind of what you were just talking a little bit about now about being linked to the universal impulse to collect stones um but you also made some comparisons between wishing stones and other artifacts that kind of happens too right yeah, you know, I think I think a really good example that a lot of our listeners are probably already familiar with are hag stones or holy stones. Yes, oh, I love them. And um, there are there are so many ways and places and 
you can find them. So many different compositions. It's one of those things where we, again, define it by appearance rather than by composition. A mm-hmm. headstone can be any rock with a hole in it, but yeah. preferably, you know. Naturally na- put there, yeah. Exactly. So uh, kind of the same thing with our wishing stones. Any, any stone that's got that beautiful band around it, again, mm-hmm. preferably put there by nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we find a, a really wide sampling of folklore around hagstones. Um, in, in certain areas, we find kind of recurring themes. You know, if you peer through them, you can see kind of beyond ordinary consciousness. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's the fair folk, maybe it's ghosts, maybe it's other things that go bump in the night or day. Yeah. Um, oftentimes they're considered to be very protective. Our, our recurring theme with virtually any strange rock that is, we go out of our way to find is that they're considered to be apotropaic. They, they ward off the things that don't serve our highest good. And I mm-hmm. think the, 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 the deeper thread there is that when, when our most ancient predecessors came across something that was really unusual, it was as if it was some sort of holy gift from the spirits or the gods or the ancestors or insert spiritual beings here. And if we have this sacred gift, this piece of the celestial, then when we carry it with us, we kind of get our status elevated just a little bit, just enough to be kind of above the fray of everyday life. So it's less likely to get us. And I think that is kind of running parallel or at least moving us toward the direction of wishing stones we find this unusual object this thing that's out there and it's so special to us that we associate something more than just aesthetic specialness it's not just special because it's got the white band but there's there's some undefinable quality that we're really trying to get close to and Mm -hmm. so much like our ancient ancestors might have picked up hag stones or other cool rocks like we'll talk about in a little bit Mm-hmm. Um, they they confer some sort of gift, and in this case, it's the gift of wishing, wish fulfillment. But you know, in other cases, it might have been protection, it might have been healing, it might have been any number of other things. And um, you know, it's it's a really fun rabbit hole to go down. And the the best part about it is, you don't have to spend a fortune on gemstones to have these effects. Exactly. Uh, there's a interesting question that just came in the chat room she says what if it has a hole and a stripe (laughs) well then i I think you should buy your winning lottery ticket (laughs) (laughs) it would be a wishing hag um (laughs) yeah that that i would like to say there probably is such a thing but the stripe would not have to be down the middle then because then it would be broken up by the hole so but I'm, I'm sure there is. And then there's another question. Um, Kat says, so a whole stone can't be one of hematite that's been made that way? Does it have to be naturally occurring, the whole? Properly to be a hag stone or a holy stone, yes. That would be the, the MO. We want to go find it in nature with that hole already present in it. Yeah. Um, but then, again, nothing is carved in stone. And, and we were talking briefly, not even face-to-face, type-to-type, um, about the things that they say that we can do with these, what they do for you. Um, and, again, this, these stones make are for wi- wishes. But um, I think any stone, in a sense, can be a wish stone because, for us anyway, um, we use intent to get what we want. So if, if we picked up a marble or we picked up a snail or we picked up anything else and believed in it and put the intention that we want something to happen because we've got this thing, um, it, it would probably work as well as something that's called a wish stone, right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, part of the mechanism, of course, is that... Um stones themselves rocks are made out of tiny little crystals or sometimes not so tiny but generally speaking they're 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 much smaller than the crystals present in you know your beautiful cluster of amethyst or you know a geode of citrine or whatever else you've got in in your sacred space but those those tiny crystals have the same basic principles that any other crystal is going to have they still transmit energy and information they still store and transmute or or um, translate energy 
they're able to vibrate or oscillate at very specific frequencies. They have memory, so they hold information, they hold energy, they, they hold our intentions, our wishes. So those same sort of physics-derived, or at least physics-adjacent principles are working with our wishing stones. Even though they might have variations in composition and chemistry, they're still going to be crystalline, and therefore they're still going to offer the same benefits that other healing stones do, at least on the most fundamental level. Mm-hmm. So if, I, if this is just out of the top of my head, so be careful because my brain works funny. But suppose a gemstone, um, before it was polished, had a band around it. Would that be considered a wishing stone, like you know, like like a ruby or a emerald or something like that? I, I suppose if we wanted it to be one, it certainly could be. <laughs> um, the what little literature I can find mostly talks about the really kind of humble rocks we find in, in everyday life. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, if, if you want to be the discoverer of a gem quality ruby that has a beautiful white band around it, just just remember to think of me. I will. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, we'll go hand in hand with that one um, and, and have to, like, put it in, like, the Tower of London because somebody would want to steal it. <laughs> or they think that we just painted it on and we were just, you know, whatever. Touche. But it, it's just, it, I mean, it's amazingly interesting. So, um, and I notice with, with all the ones I have, they're all basically the same. They're all that, um, and I, I don't know what type this is, but they're very kind of grainy, rustic gray rocks. Um, and um, with the white band, some, like you said, some are thick bands. One, ha- this one I have looks like somebody iced it with with cake icing. It's so beautiful. It's just this fine little thick band around towards the end. It looks really, really nice. But I haven't seen. I think I've somebody was showing me a picture of. Um, they had white stones. I don't know what they were. They more they looked more like crystal actually, and they had like. Um, faint black stripes around them so i i don't know what that would be but that was kind of a way different than my things which i consider very very rustic and and whatever yeah that sounds pretty nifty yeah but they can be of any color of any shape and size and and you know i've taken pictures i put them up on uh facebook and, you know, some of them fit in the palm of your hand. They're thumbnail size. Some of them are, you know, whatever. And then they're the mini boulders, you know, that you get a hernia trying to pick up. It's just it, it's <laughs> such an amazing thing. Um, in a metaphysical sense, um, you know, again, the rock is sometimes is the tool. And and they say that the power would not maybe lay, lay in the doesn't lay in the stone but it comes from within it's the powers that we make it it's what lies within us um, is the representation I mean the stone is the repre- representation of that so um, it, it's just no rules about this I mean I think anybody that has a wishing stone or or a hag stone or, or whatever it is like you said before you can do with it what you want and and it'll it'll work for you because nature is really friendly, right? Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I live in Florida, and we have some really unfriendly nature here. Yes, yeah, I, yeah, that's true. Well, all right, in the mineral class, at least you don't have um, ones that kind of jump up and conk you in the head when you're not looking. You know, they don't, you, they're not dangerous on their own. Yeah, but, just don't lick them. Ew. <laughs> Do people lick rocks ever? Um, you'd be surprised. Old, old, old school rock hounds. You know, sometimes it's a good way to find out what something's going to look like. If you if you polish it, you get it wet, and if you don't want to spare any of your drinking water, that's a way to do it. But you can also tell salt, like halite, from other things real fast with a quick flick of the tongue. But um, you know, sometimes you're wrong, and your taste buds let you know, and you regret it. So um, I have been there. Um, I don't recommend. Do not lick your rocks, please. Are, are some poisonous by nature or yeah. maybe just because you found them? So, so um, what, what yeah, would be... Some, so I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, what would be some poisonous stones that we should not lick? Um, well, you know, think of the same things you wouldn't want to ingest on their own. Don't lick things that contain lead or arsenic or antimony. Um, so 
Um, there, there are plenty of things out there that you should probably avoid. There are some things that are relatively soluble, like chalcanthite, mm. um, which are, you know, that, that would be really bad. That amount of copper in your body would, would do horrible things to you. So, um, let's not give that a go. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, they're, they're a- apart from that. Most rocks are relatively inert and safe as long as you don't cut yourself on the sharp ones or, or ingest the poisonous ones, you're pretty safe around rocks. Or trip over them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I don't know why this popped into my head again, but I was just thinking of tombstones. Now, what are tombstones generally made of, or what were they used to always generally be made of? I know a lot of them are marble now, but some of the older ones are very um, rustic-looking, porous kind of things. Um, was there a special stone at some point? I know you may not know, but um, that tombstones were made out of for any particular reason? Um Mostly it was just what you had nearby and also what was easy to carve. So you find a lot of like slate, slate cleaves and really flat planes. So that way it's, it's easy to kind of take apart. It'll keep that shape and it's generally soft enough to carve pretty darn easy. Um, so really old ones you'll find that way. Um, things like marble, um, which is you know much softer than something like granite. You find a lot of granite tombstones today because they last a heck of a lot longer. But you need really good tools to be able to carve into it. Um, but you know prior to prior to the you know current era, you you use the rocks you had available to you. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes sense. Are there any rocks that are particularly linked to um, funerals or? deaths or, or things like that, that that have that connotation? I mean, maybe, I think Jet was, because didn't they used to make mourning pins and things out of that? But, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was, oh, it, it was one of the queens in mourning who popularized it. And I want to say Victoria, but I'm, I'm, I'm fuzzy on the history there, so please don't quote me. But yeah, yeah I think she, you like that. She actually is the one who made Jet so popular in mourning because she she dressed the part for such a long time and, and always had black jewelry to match her her black attire. Um, but there are so many stones that have these kind of funereal associations, um, mm. one of which is jade. Um, mm. I mean, emperors mm. have been buried with jade in their orifices, every one of them in China. Mm. Um, entire mm. suits have been made of jade, and part of it is because jade is so durable, um, that it withstands the erosive nature of time itself. I mean, time can beat down mountains, but it will leave jade boulders intact. And so if you can carve something that is essentially eternal, and in, you know, pre-modern era, it was really difficult to carve jade and give it a high polish. It took Mm -hmm. a long time and a lot of manpower. So to have an artifact like this, where the artist's work would literally live forever, then... Mm -hmm. If we were buried with that, there was a piece of us that also lived forever. There's a lot of kind of lore around jade about it preventing uh, putrefaction, which is why it was, you know, featured in such intimate ways, we'll say, um, <laughs> with jade plugging us up to keep us from, um, you know, going through decomposition and things. I'm not, I'm not mm-hmm. suggesting that actually worked, um, but even even entire suits made out of jade to cover you from head to toe would commonly be found. Um, and you also have jade masks in places like all, all throughout Central and South America with the pre-Columbian cultures. You have jade funerary masks also being found in ancient China. So these are, these are things that would be worn into the grave to have that association. Um, mm-hmm. Another one that's got a really profound kind of funerary connection is quartz. Um, really? Yeah, there are so many um, tombs all throughout Europe where quartz artifacts were interred with people, oftentimes round things like globes and spheres and little tiny beads that were round-shaped. Um, there's there's a, a certain sect of philosophy that believed that our, our sun that we saw was not the actual sun, um, mm. but was part of a threefold phenomenon that started with the sort of great light of the universe that was ambient. It wasn't focused or concentrated in one place. It went through a crystal sphere, a crystal lens, Mm. and then was refracted at us. And so what we saw was the end result of that three-stage process. And so there is this mythology of the crystal sun that that brought light 
into incarnation that brought light here. And so if we had our own little mini crystal sun, our own crystal ball that we were buried with, we could use it to go in reverse and return to the heavens once we left our body. Mm-hmm. I like that. All right, we got a new question from the chat room, and it's a good one, but we've got to take a quick break. So everybody just hang in there, and um, we'll be right back with Nicholas Pearson, Wishing Stones, and all kinds of other goodies. Stirring the Cauldron will be right back, so don't go away. If you end up with webbed feet, remember, you've been warned. Explore the second edition of the Witch's Oracle deck through 45 innovative cards and enhanced guidebook that peers into the world of the witch. The deck's stunning artwork has a new look and includes seven brand new inspirational cards. Each card now includes a suggested crystal or gemstone to enhance your reading as well as a magical incantation that provides energy, reinforces the card's meaning, and helps the desired message to be sent out into the universe. The easy-to-navigate guide also has a new look and offers straightforward, gentle guidance that takes readers through both good times and bad, and now includes a chapter on crystal and gemstone divination by the amazing Nicholas Pearson. The Witch's Oracle. It is a perfect divination deck for witches as well as non-pagans and is designed to suit both seasoned readers and beginners alike. Find out more about the Witch's Oracle deck at www.marlabrooks.com and you can purchase the deck from shifferbooks.com, amazon.com or order a copy from your favorite bookseller. You've no doubt heard of Tango and Cash, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Perhaps it takes two to tango. Well, now, on the first and third Thursdays of each month, there's a show called Tango and Friends at 8 p.m. Eastern on the Para-X Radio Network with your host, Bruce Tango. And yes, there will be at least two to tango on each episode, sometimes even more. There's going to be lots of topics and lots of guests you'll all know and lots of surprises. Prizes. Tango and Friends, every first and third Thursday of the month at 8 p.m. right here on the Para-X Radio Network. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. And here we are with Nicholas Pearson, and we're talking about wishing stones and other kinds of stones and all kinds of good stuff. And before the break, I mentioned that there was a question that just had come in in the chat room. And here it is, Nicholas. How is the wishing stone different than the philosopher's stone? Ah, well, a really simple answer is the philosopher's stone is a mythological substance, and the wishing stone is something you can go out and find. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, wasn't the philosopher's stone, it had to do with longevity, right? If, yeah, if my so, Harry Potter and, and everything is correct, yeah. Absolutely. The, the kind of literal interpretation of the alchemical practices that we see um, preserved in myth and lore and, and actual practice um, says that one of, the, one of the final points of studying alchemy was to render this material called the Philosopher's Stone. And from it, you could both create the elixir of life that granted you immortality and freedom from all illness, as well as use it to transmute base metals into gold. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Nicholas Flamel wasn't there. That was, I couldn't think of the name. Yeah. That's him. Yes. Well, we maybe, you know, we could all use one of those too, as far as I know. Um, Also, Cece put a note in um, the chat. That was something I didn't, really think of or didn't realize but she said that Sears and Roebuck tombstones are made from zinc have you heard that did you know that no I mean I I imagine um, zinc itself might be a little reactive to the environment but um, yeah not familiar Mm, okay they're just you know I I like little anecdotal things that that come up Um, so Back to the back to the wishing stone for a minute. Um, have you, since you found out about the wishing stone, um, have you come across any? And would you be very tempted to make a wish on one if you got it? Um, you know, I haven't found any since we 
first started talking about them, but I found out I already had some from a trip to Vermont I took a, a few springs ago. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so um, I found those while walking around a lake, the name of which I cannot remember, but it was it was very brisk weather, and I didn't venture far because I'm a Florida boy at heart through and through, and it was <laughs> it was a very, very unusually cold April. Um, my first time visiting Vermont, and they assure me it's too late in the year for snow, and the moment my plane comes in to the little airport in Burlington, it begins to snow. So um, that was that was a fun experience, but I, I picked up weird rocks because that's what I do, and mm-hmm. some of them actually qualified as wishing stones. Wow. Are you going to try one? Uh, he- yeah, here's here's the rub. I, it means I have to let go of a rock, doesn't it? See, yes, I was, that, that's why I, I just, you know, I was going to interrupt you with that because I, I don't. There's a couple of them here that I won't let go for anything because it's just kind of wonderfully. Um, and but yeah, I, I'm feeling bad. I mean, all the ones I, I feel okay. Here's another thing. All the ones I brought in the house, they're all piled together in different containers and they're on display but then I'm feeling bad because I took them out of nature like maybe they shouldn't be in here does that make sense you know I I get what you're saying but I'm gonna I'm gonna pose a little philosophical uh, counterpoint to that okay every everything in our homes ultimately comes from nature yes. there there really is no separateness from our kind of what we think of as synthetic and artificial lifestyle from nature. We've just learned how to, well, we'll say tweak our microclimate to be a little bit more enjoyable, to adjust the the comfort levels, the aesthetics. And um, we are not inherently separate from nature on a spiritual level. And I think having those stones with us on the one hand might be satisfying that, that primal impulse to be back in a more rustic and natural setting, but, but also it's, you know, the ooh shiny object syndrome. We, we all want to have that, that piece of magic, whether we are talking literal magic because mm-hmm. we're going to make a wish with them or the metaphorical magic of, you know, shifting perceptions um, by bringing that, that unusual object into our lives. Um, and this is something that's gone on for a long time. And, and surprisingly, even this whole precedent of having to toss the stone away, mm-hmm. for me, you know, I, I think this comes from a very, very ancient practice. Mm. And one that was practiced not only with stones, but with plenty of other things. But since we're talking about rocks today, that's what we'll focus on. So um, if you visit any sort of ancient well or spring or pool or pond that was said to have healing qualities or somehow be blessed by the gods, um, chances are if, if you were to you know, look for archaeological evidence of how it's been used, you're going to find very strange rocks that have been placed in it or beside it or tossed into the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, even, even through the medieval period, this is a practice that continued, but it, you know, it starts in like ancient Greece, ancient Rome, probably even earlier than that. Mm-hmm. And these are votive offerings. And oftentimes, if someone had a particular illness or injury that afflicted a, you know, one part of the body, an organ, an extremity, you might find a stone that resembled that part of you. Mm. And you might rub it on the afflict- afflicted part. You might you know, speak a prayer over it. You might recite an incantation. You might wrap it up with a spell written around it. And you would go to this holy well and toss it out. And in part, what you're doing is you're kind of surrendering the problem over you're, you're saying, hey, pay attention to this thing. You know, my, my hand is injured and here is a stone that looks like my hand. Um, but the other thing you're doing is a sort of magical art of transference. You're taking that, that energy, that problem, that situation that you want to remedy, mm-hmm. and you're transferring it to the stone and then you're giving it away. So that way it's, it's no longer your problem. And rather than just focusing on the things we want to let go of, over time, we start to see this same phenomenon translating to um, things we want to bring into our lives instead, which is why we still go to wells and fountains and toss coins in with a wish. Mm -hmm. So here we've got wishing stones, their exact origin perhaps unknown to us, but calling upon these really ancient practices, what 
you know, what some scholars in previous years might have called primitive. But we like to think of ourselves as highly refined here in the 21st century, and we're doing the same stuff. And that's yeah. what's so fascinating <laughs> about this. Um, e even without studying the phenomenon, even without like doing the academic research to find out why we do this, we all know why. It's, it's instinct. It's natural. It feels right. And the everyday world requires magic if we're going to get through it. And I don't mean, you know, magic in the sense of like witchcraft or the occult, but we need mystery. We need imagination. We need levity. We need hope. And mm. the practice of, of making that wish gives it to us. And I think one of the, the, the greatest traumas we collectively experience is that sort of, you know, um, the, the alienation from our childhood imagination, the separateness from, from being serious versus, you know, being able to be in the moment and have that, that magic and that hope. And, um, I mean, there, there are weird rocks that humankind have, have collected for a lot longer than you would imagine. Would would you like to guess the uh, the earliest the earliest record of preserving a rock because it was special or different or other um, that I've been able to find so far? I mean, not okay. me personally out in the field, but that that has been documented. How okay, how, how long ago? Go ahead. A hint. Um, well, the answer is old, <laughs> older than you think. Older than dirt. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> some some dirt, probably yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, um, t do tell. About half a million years old, which mm. means that this isn't just a Homo sapiens thing. We're, we're talking like Homo erectus, Homo habilis. Um, mm. In a museum in Liverpool, there is a very strange artifact that, that is, um, you know, kept there. Um, it's what we call an Atulian hand axe. It was the original Swiss army knife. You could cut with it. You could stab with it. You could mm -hmm. scrape with it. You could pound with it. That was about it. But, I mean, yeah. those are all the essential functions you needed in the tool. And they're mm -hmm. kind of triangular. They had bilateral symmetry. You usually have two edges sharpened and a, and a blunt base. So you can hammer, scrape, and cut, and then hammer, scrape, and cut some more. Um, but um, there's this one particular one. They're usually made out of flint. And this one has a strange marking on it. It actually contains a fossil sea urchin and the artifact was never finished because the last blow that was given to it by whoever was making it accidentally struck part of the fossil sea urchin in the center, flaked a bit off, and they never finished it because they didn't want to damage the sea urchin anymore. They were going out of their way to find this rock with a special marking, this five-pointed star in the center of it. That's what a fossil sea urchin shows. And they wanted to make it into something special, but then they couldn't finish that process because it was too precious. They didn't want to lose what was special about it. Oh my God, I saw something like that. I don't know if it was a fiction show or, or you know, a, a Discovery Channel thing, but I, that sounds so familiar to me. So I must have heard it somewhere before, but I can't figure out where. Hmm. Yeah, and, and, you know, half a million years ago, the yeah. the the earliest... Um, archaeological evidence that suggests that humans went out of their way for quartz crystals in particular um, is anywhere from 250 to 450,000 years ago, which, mm. isn't, which isn't quite as old. It's still a really yeah. long time, mind you. Yeah. And that also puts it at prior to Homo sapiens. So the human urge to go out and collect rocks that are special and then to attribute to them a distinctive power or quality or influence over our lives mm -hmm. is something that has happened since the dawn of time itself. Wow. Wow. So we're all carrying on customs from way back then. Yeah, I like that. Uh, we've got like two or three questions that I want to get to before we um, start winding down and ask asking you all kinds of things about what's going on with you. But one of the questions is, if someone from the prehistoric era had died in a cave, would their energy be imbued in the stalagmites and stalactites around them? Um, maybe. Um, it, it would depend on a whole lot of factors, I think. Um, we are inherently ephemeral beings, Um you know, most of us don't stick around in the place where we pass away. Some of us do. Some of us are stubborn like that. <laughs> um, so that that might be. But, you know, a prehistory is a really, really, really wide period. 
So there are stalactites and stalagmites that could have formed long after the departure of this person from their physical vessel. Um, some of those sedimentary rocks, although they still take quite a long time to, to form, don't necessarily take hundreds of thousands of years, like, like it, someone hypothetically could have died in there. So um, mm -hmm. while that is possible, and while I think stone has memory, the other thing to consider from the physics perspective of it is crystals have memory of a particular event or energy or intention until a louder or stronger energy comes in and supersedes it. So it's like, you know, if you've got the old school um, cassette recorder, you can demagnetize the cassette and lose all the information on it because that, that magnet has a much stronger energy field than the one used to create the sound impression that's on there. And then what mm -hmm. do you do? You just tape over it. You can create a new sound on there. Mm -hmm. So um, it might be that at one point, someone's energy was preserved in that cave until some other event that had a, a louder amplitude, a louder frequency, um, came in and, and superseded it. Mm, that's a good answer. Thank you. Um, the other question was, uh, most of the rocks we'd be able to pick up are pieces off larger ones. Um, wouldn't that make them less a part of nature in a way because they're orphans or whatever? <laughs> Um, I mean, is, is a grain of sand less a part of nature than a mountain? Um, mm. And th they're both rocks of, of differing sizes. So I, I like to think no. I think once we shape them in some way intentionally, they, they become a co-creative act. It's not just nature on its own. It's human and nature have gotten together to create something. But, you know, if we go out and find it as is, nature's done all of that activity. The, the breaking down into smaller bits, the smoothing of it, the transporting of it from its original locus, um, as well as the, the generative impulse that created the rock in the very beginning. Um, so I, I would like to think that you go out into nature and you find a rock, it is equally as part of nature as the boulder. Good, 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 good. Um, another question, do meteorites have any special meaning? Oh, tons, so, <laughs> so much meaning. Um, more than we could probably touch upon here, but um, there are some super fun myths that surround them. A lot of times meteorites are connected to the sort of archetypes of like um, the, the divine masculine in the form of like god of the sky, god of storms, god of the mountaintop. Um, and this translates to a, a whole network of, of deities. And so um, because meteorites range down from the heavens, and especially the most common varieties are the nickel iron, and they're made out of metal. Metal, of course, being conductive of electricity, something you can melt down. Um, it, it becomes a sort of really special form of iron, iron being associated with you know, technology and implements and war. So there's a whole other face of the divine masculine that we see embodied in meteorites. Um, very protective, um, very very strange because by composition they should be very grounding, but since they didn't come from Earth, they don't feel grounding. Hmm. Okay, that makes good sense. Hang on just a second, I got. I think I lost something. That okay, there it is. Another question: <laughs> um, When people take rocks from Mauna Loa volcano, they're said to be cursed. Can the Earth curse the rocks we pick up? Well, the, the entirety of, of those kinds of myths start with the veneration of a particular goddess, Pele. And mm -hmm. so it's not the earth who's cursing the rocks, but it is Pele giving retribution to human beings taking her children without her permission. And I mean, if anyone kidnaps a child, that mother is going to spew all kinds of un unpleasant vibes toward the kidnapper, right? Mm -hmm. So. That's, that's really the mechanism behind this myth. It's not that the rocks themselves are cursed. It's that you didn't make the, the necessary um, gifts or offerings to Pele. You didn't ask permission. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's, she's protective of her children. So I don't, yes. I don't think that any rocks are inherently cursed. But again, it's, it's a cultural thing. So um, our, our small beliefs in, you know, the personal levels was the, how we fit into the wider context all kind of shape our experience of working with stones. Okay. I have a question. Um, 
because, you know, we all collect crystals and stones for certain properties, you know, hematite for healing and, you know, whatever. So are there any other stones and crystals that work well that are known to be wishing stones without being the ones we're talking about now? Yes. Um, Flint is, is one of them that has a really long association of drawing good things to you of some sort as well as repelling bad things away from you of, of another sort. Um, white quartz, not necessarily the gem quality, clear crystalline quartz that we think of when we think of quartz crystal today, but, you know, think of like just white quartz stones, um, quartzite, um, that, that especially in the British Isles and other parts of Western Europe was once thought to be very holy and very sacred in a part, in, in addition to, you know, drawing your desires, your wishes, your intentions to you. It was also used for um, all sorts of healing and protection magic, deeply linked to the moon. It was thought that if you um, created essentially a, a crystal elixir, to use modern technology, modern mm-hmm. terminology, um, with these under moonlight, that it would imbue the moon's cooling and healing qualities to the water, and that would cure illness. Um, jade is one that has long been associated with granting wishes. Um, the, the list could go on and on. Uh, the one common theme is any sort of stone that has strange phenomenon to it. So like the flash we see in moonstone or the six-rayed star that appears on a star ruby or star sapphire, those sort of phenomenological stones would, would be things that would be really eye-catching, but also feel to be kind of we'll say more spiritually alive, at least optically speaking, than than other stones, those were long thought to have the ability to grant wishes. Mm, yeah, because I mean, you know, people, I think people walk around with something and they'll say, well, this is my lucky stone because it's a birthstone or, or you know, so it, you're really attracted to it. But I just didn't know if there were certain ones that are known, like for just those purposes. But I think Maybe I'm wrong, but I guess most stones have more than one um, attribute to them, right? For sure. You know, they're, they're as multidimensional as we are. That's scary. Um, cause <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I just kind of really think it, it's, it's the whole thing is, you know, and get, ju- judging from the questions that are coming in tonight, I think you need to come back at some time, and it's just going to be to ask you questions. I love I that think, idea. Yeah, because I think there's, you know, one thing leads to the other. We start with wishing stones, and we're going to end with wishing stones, in a sense. I just put a picture in chat about some wishing stones in case people that are listening don't know what they look like. Well, but those are just samples. <laughs> they're, they're, they all look different. Um, but, yeah, I think I think you need to come back one day and just be open to all the questions that, you know, come after you. and. and that, that's good for easy for an hour show. So we'll do that. Now, before we have to leave, um, we've got to talk about you for a minute because you're doing a lot of things lately. Um, and I know that let's start with um, the event or two that you have coming up very soon. For sure. Thank you so much for asking. Um, Ordinarily, during the summertime, I'd be traveling. I did have a new book that dropped earlier this year in February. We we already talked about on the show, that's Crystal Basics. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I would be on tour signing books, but um, the world's not conducive to that right now. So I've been given the opportunity to do a lot of online events. So I'll be presenting at a, a festival this weekend called Temple Fest. Um, but the, the following weekend, I am going to be doing a, my own workshop online, and it's called Flower Essences for Troubled Times. And it's going to be on Saturday, which I, I think is going to be the 28th or the 29th of August in the afternoon. Um, and I'm going to be talking about how we can work with the gifts of the plant kingdom to get us through this sort of funk that the world is and the stress of even just ordinary everyday life. You're, you're still allowed to be stressed about those things, too. It's still there. So we're going to be looking at a, a really brief history of flower essences, how they've kind of come to be, and what are some really good plant allies that can help us in that way. And, um, you know, it's I think it's going to be fun because people know me as the rock guy. Maybe they know me as the Reiki guy, but I'm also mm-hmm. a plant guy sometimes too. Yes. 
Yes, you are. You're a guy, a man for all seasons, or a guy for all seasons. I don't know. <laughs> for, for all reasons. Better better than that. Um, so this thing that's happening on the 28th, um, how, can anybody join in? How do they find out about it? Do they need to make reservations? Is it coming out, going over like Zoom or something like that? Details, please. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be on, I have the exact date here in front of me, um, August 29th from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. I will be doing it via Zoom. Um, if you visit um, my, my Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash The Luminous Pearl, um, you can find the events that are listed um, or just type in The Luminous Pearl if you're scrolling through Facebook. Um, and you'll be able to register online. It's $25 for the two-hour class. Um, I will be offering a recording. So if it's something where you can't attend live, you live in another time zone and that's not a convenient time, or you're going to be working and you're uh, fearing that you might miss it, I will send out a recording. Um, we're going to talk about um, quite a number of flowers. I'm going to try to pare things down. I have too long of a list right now. And I, I really want to focus not just on like the more famous ones made by um, you know, Dr. Bach, like we think of rescue remedy, of course, mm -hmm. we'll talk about some old favorites there, but I also want to maybe highlight some plants that might be growing in your own backyard that you could work with to create flower essences in a safe way, um, that, that can help you through the, the stress of the world. Even when the world's at its best, it yeah. can be stressful. And flower essences are like these tuning forks for your emotional body. They mm -hmm. bring us back into states of harmony and balance and they do it seemingly effortlessly um i'm i am walking the earth today i continue to walk the earth today because of the help that flower essences have given me in some really trying times earlier in my life and mm -hmm. i am always amazed at how gentle and effective they are that's fascinating absolutely fascinating i'm going to try to be there um because, yeah, I mean, we probably all have things in the yard. We all need a little bit of help this way. And and as far as I know, most of the people in my chat room are into nature, flowers, that kind of thing. So, yeah, check for the Luminous Pearl. And um, if you have Zoom, it's not hard to get. All right, one more quick, quick thing before we go. You're working on a new book, and that has something to do with what you're going to be talking about um, <laughs> in the event coming up. Yes? Yes, I am working on a new book. I have been kind of researching ways that flower essences can be used outside the normal therapeutic context. So the book is tentatively titled, just the working title, is Flowers from a Witch's Garden, mm. Flower Essences in Healing, Magic, and Alchemy. Oh, I can't wait. Every time you announce a new book, I mean, I'm on tender hooks for a year or whenever it takes to get them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. All right. So best place for them to find you is at your website, luminouspearl.com. The yeah, Luminous I, Pearl. Absolutely. Yeah. You can find me there, the theluminouspearl.com. If, if you are a social media user, there's a good chance my handle is probably the Luminous Pearl on whatever platform you're using. I'm usually pretty active on Instagram, a little less so on, on my official Facebook page, um, but I'm, I'm easy to track down. So yes, please yes, find me, are. reach out, and I look forward to sharing the, the workshop with you all next uh. weekend. That's going to be great. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And um, I'm going to make a wish and throw the stone that I can make it there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I may send you a stone just because. Um, anyway, thank you. Um, thank you all for listening in. Much, much, much appreciated. And until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited.